If you have gestational diabetes and you are frustrated with your high morning blood sugars, then today I'm gonna to show you how to get those under control and get perfect morning blood sugars. This is one of the most common questions that I get and one of the biggest sources of stress. One of the women in my gestational diabetes Facebook group said that she is so stressed because she's following the diet that her diabetes team and her doctor gave her and she's, she's doing everything that she can and her fasting blood sugars still aren't within her target range. She said she feels so stressed and she feels like her let, she's letting her baby daughter down. And this absolutely breaks my heart. And if you are feeling this way, I want you to know that this is absolutely not your fault. And we can absolutely figure this out and get your fasting blood sugar under control. If you're new to the channel, my name is Jessica Pumple, and I am a registered dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a certified bariatric educator, or a certified weight loss educator. And I work with and help moms who have gestational diabetes, have healthy babies that are a healthy size. And I also work with moms after they've had gestational diabetes to lose the baby weight and for type 2 diabetes prevention. This video is one in a series of videos that I'm doing for gestational diabetes, so you can check out the playlist there. And also, we put out new videos every Wednesday, so make sure that you subscribe to the channel and ding the bell to make sure that you get notified every Wednesday when we put out a new video. Of course, this is general information only, and for individualized medical advice, you should always refer to your own doctor or diabetes team. Before I explain the strategies on how we can fix our morning or our fasting blood sugar, I'm going to really briefly explain what is going on in gestational diabetes in the body so that you can understand why what I'm saying makes sense. So in gestational diabetes, as the baby grows, the placenta grows, the placenta produces hormones. So for example, estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, human placental lactogen, and these hormones cause insulin resistance. So all women towards the end of their pregnancy have a certain amount of insulin resistance, and actually our natural insulin levels at the end of pregnancy are about doubled to help compensate for this insulin resistance. However, with gestational diabetes, where we're running into trouble is if the insulin resistance is greater and our pancreas, which is the organ that produces uh, insulin from the beta cells, can't keep up with the insulin production to overcome the extra insulin resistance. So this is why right after delivery, you deliver the baby, you deliver the placenta, you're no longer producing those hormones. Usually blood sugars go right back down to a healthy range right away. So there are two things that increase our blood sugar. One is carbohydrate food, and these foods are the grains and starches, fruit and the milk and alternatives, and of course, any added sugars. And the second place that we can get an increased blood sugar from is our liver. Our liver acts as our backup sugar storage locker. And when we eat carbohydrate foods, we store some of it in our liver and 24 hours a day, so between meals and overnight, our liver puts out a drip of sugar to make sure that our cells, especially our brain cells, are getting the energy that they need. So I'm going to get into all of these specifically, but the things that we can do to lower our fasting blood sugar are lower the glycemic load and the glycemic index. So the glycemic load is going to be the carbohydrate amount that we're having, and the glycemic index is going to be how quickly our blood sugar goes up and down. So I'm going to talk about strategies to lower the glycemic index as well. We also want to make sure that we have the right timing of carbohydrate. And we want to make sure that we're not going too low in carbohydrate. So because our liver also puts out sugar, for some women, if they go too low in their carbohydrates, then the liver can dump out sugar and our blood sugars can still be high. If you're looking for a full meal plan for gestational diabetes to have not only good fasting blood sugars, but good post-meal or post-prandial blood sugars, and if you're looking for lots of snack ideas, I have more than 25 snack ideas for good blood sugars as well, and I will put that in the description box for good blood sugars and a healthy baby. I'm also going to talk about exercise to reduce blood sugar and timing and the best type of exercise. And I will also link to a video of exercise for gestational diabetes. And lastly, I'm going to talk about supplements, medications, and insulin to get your fasting blood sugar down. 
So for carbohydrate amount, we want to aim for about 90 to 150 grams of carbohydrate per day spread evenly throughout the day. So that would make for about 20 to 40 grams of carbohydrate for each meal. Um, women tend to be a little bit more insulin resistant in the early morning hours. So for breakfast, one might want to go a little bit lighter on the carbohydrates. And then for a bedtime snack, usually a maximum of 15 to 20 grams of carbohydrate works well. If this is different from what your doctor or your diabetes team is telling you, my colleague Lily Nichols has an amazing book, um, Real Food for Gestational Diabetes, and it looks at all of the research about why this is a good amount of carbohydrate to have, and I will put the link to this book below in the description box as well. Next is eating low glycemic index. So if someone is eating a low glycemic index during gestational diabetes, it can reduce their risk of having to start insulin by up to 50%. And so things that we can do to reduce the glycemic index of the foods and have less of a spike. So for eating something that is high glycemic index, it's going to send our blood sugar up and then down quickly. And a low glycemic index is going to be a lower curve there. And we want to try and keep our blood sugars as stable as possible. So things that we can do to lower the glycemic index are choosing whole grains over refined grains. And so with the whole grain, there's still the fiber part of the grain in there, and that actually slows the absorption of the carbohydrate down. So we want to have whole grains. So when you're buying things, this can be really deceiving. So if it says multigrain or nine grain, that doesn't necessarily mean whole grain. We want to look for 100% whole grain um, on the packaging when we're purchasing things. Also, if we're adding protein and fat, this also slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. So making sure that we're rounding out our meals and snacks with healthy fats and protein can also lower the glycemic index. The other thing that can lower the glycemic index is adding acidic food. So using a salad dressing that is a vinaigrette or adding tomatoes or other acidic food can actually um, decrease the glycemic index and blunt that increase in your blood sugar. And the research shows that it helps for about the next 30 minutes. There is a trend right now, and some women in my Facebook community are using apple cider vinegar to try to help lower their fasting blood sugars. And some women swear by it. So I had a look at the research and there's no research of women during gestational diabetes showing the um, what apple cider vinegar does. Um, however, we do know, so if we can sort of extrapolate from other studies, either in type 2 diabetes or in animals, we do know that it has a glycemic index lowering effect. So there is that benefit. And when they studied the effect of apple cider vinegar in rats, they did find that it altered the digestive enzymes that digest both sugars and fats and that it improved the metabolism of the sugars and fats. But this study was still just done on rats and not in humans. In type 2 diabetes, there has been research to show um, that there can be a slight improvement for blood sugars in type 2 diabetes, but um, some studies show there is a slight benefit and some studies show there is no benefit. So I will leave it up to you if it's something you want to try. It is a very low risk thing to try it as long as you're using the pasteurized um, apple cider vinegar. Um, you want to make sure that you're not using the unpasteurized apple cider apple cider vinegar um, because of the risk of contamination and um, the risk of getting some sort of foodborne illness to your baby. Other things that are linked with insulin resistance that you can do, um, research does show that a diet high in animal protein can also be linked with increased insulin resistance. So including more foods that are high in plant proteins could be beneficial, as well as vitamin D and calcium deficiencies are also linked with insulin resistance. So making sure that you're getting your vitamin D requirements met, as well as including foods that are calcium rich can also help. The other lifestyle option that you can use to lower your fasting blood sugar and your blood sugars overall is exercise. So exercise works in a similar way to insulin in that it has a blood glucose or a blood lowering effect. So when we use our muscles, they require energy and sugar and the sugar moves from our bloodstream into our cells where we're using it for exercise. 
And so we can use exercise at specific times to get specific effects. The blood sugar ring lowering effects of exercise may be right away. They can lower your blood sugar immediately after, or you can have the benefit for up to 24 hours after. So if you're looking at lowering your morning blood sugars, then exercise really can be any time of day or spread throughout the day to have that 24 hour effect. If you're on insulin, then after a meal is an excellent time to exercise because when you're on insulin, you're at risk of a low blood sugar. And so given that your blood sugars are going to be a little bit high after a meal with carbohydrate, one to two hours after a meal is going to help bring it back down into a target range with less risk of going low. When we look at the research and the continuous glucose monitoring reports or CGM reports that are monitoring blood sugars 24 hours a day, we can see that the benefit of exercise isn't necessarily always directly after, but this shows that it can be the next day. And with longer duration and more vigorous exercise, that the blood glucose or blood sugar lowering effect often is the next day. So for example, if someone was to go on a bike tour and they were doing more exercise than they usually would, they're biking for the whole day, it's very likely that they may have a low blood sugar the next day. So these studies are usually done with people with type 1 diabetes. If we extrapolate that data, it's not exactly the same someone with type 1 diabetes who doesn't produce any insulin um, endogenously or within themselves to someone with gestational diabetes. However, we do know that they both have exercise has a glucose lowering effect and we can see some similar results. However, in pregnancy, you always want to make sure that the exercise that you're doing is safe. And again, I will link to a video there of an interval HIT workout that is designed for pregnancy and to be safe in pregnancy. Okay, so what happens if you've done all of the lifestyle things that I've talked about and your morning blood sugars are still elevated? The truth is, if you've done everything that you can in terms of lifestyle, that your pancreas may not just be working properly, which is a problem with gestational diabetes. And the insulin resistance that happens for every woman in pregnancy and in gestational diabetes, your pancreas just may not be able to keep up with that extra insulin production that is needed, and you may need to supplement with medications or insulin. If you're not on insulin yet, I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear. However, the risk to your baby of letting your blood sugars run high and your blood sugar passing through the placenta barrier to your baby and causing your baby to be big and have other risk factors is much more harmful than adding in insulin, which is an analog to the natural insulin that we produce anyways. So insulin is different in a medication in that there isn't any other side effects, except that if you have too much, that you can end up with hypoglycemia or a low blood sugar. If you are on insulin, I'm going to talk about just in a second why you may be on insulin and not seeing um, your blood sugars come down again. But first, I'm going to chat about the medications. So there are two medications um, that have been studied in gestational diabetes. Um, no oral um, gestational diabetes medications are approved, but metformin and glybride have been studied and have they have not been shown to be harmful to the fetus. And so metformin is also used in PCOS and so quite commonly used in pregnancy. And metformin can help with insulin resistance and it can also help slow down that drip of sugar from that's coming out from the liver and that would be the benefit to taking metformin. Glyburide is another medication that is sometimes used if insulin is not an option. However, there is a concern because the glyburide passes the placental barrier to the baby that um, glyburide works by sort of squeezing or giving your pancreas a little kick to produce extra insulin of its own. And there is a concern that because it passes through to the baby that it is increasing the baby's in insulin production as well. And that could have long-term consequences later down the line, potentially of things like type 2 diabetes um, for the baby later in life. 
So because the oral medications or the pills um, may or may not be helpful enough, as well as they're not approved in pregnancy, and there may be some risks to them, um, physicians and diabetes specialists tend to recommend insulin. So the ones that are approved for pregnancy are going to be the rapid-acting insulins, and so you're going to get your Nova Rapid or your Novolog, and then the other one, um, the other brand is Humalog, or your long-acting insulins, uh, Levomir is also approved in pregnancy. NPH is also another insulin called a regular insulin, and this has a time duration that is sort of in between the rapid-acting insulins and the long-acting insulins. However, if it's possible to use the rapid and the long, NPH is an older insulin, and there's higher risk of low blood sugars, and so it's not the preferred insulin to use. So the rapid acting insulins, so the Nova Rapid or the Novolog and the Humalog are called bolus insulins, and they're used um, before a meal or with a meal to um, help the carbohydrate from the meal be moved from the bloodstream into the cells, and it works for about four hours. And the long acting insulin is going to work all day, and it's going to take care of the sugar from the liver that the liver is constantly dripping out and moving that sugar from the blood into the cells. So unless somebody is eating, eating a lot of carbohydrate for dinner or for a bedtime snack, often the reason that someone has a high blood sugar in the morning is going to be from the sugar that the liver is putting out. And so a physician might prescribe a long acting insulin to help with fasting blood sugars in the morning. When someone is started on insulin, because low blood sugars are a greater risk for diabetes or gestational diabetes, um, you don't even want to have, you want to try to avoid even one low blood sugar, whereas high blood sugar, if you have a few blood sugars that are getting a little bit higher, that is not going to be harmful to the baby. High blood sugars get really harmful when it goes untreated, and so you have a little bit of time to titrate up and get the blood sugars down but you want to avoid having any low blood sugars at all. So when healthcare providers start insulin, they start on a very tiny, tiny safe dose, and then they titrate up from there. So often I will hear moms that are started on insulin and maybe they titrate up for a few days or even a week and they're not seeing their blood sugars move, but they may have so much insulin resistance that these tiny, tiny doses are not making a big difference. And so when your physician gives you a titration schedule, you want to be able to stick with it and increase it because you may need higher levels. So if you're started on four or six or even 20, this may be a really low dose and you may need to go high, way higher up from there. So I've seen women on 100, 150. And so there is a lot of flexibility. There's no upper dose to the insulin as long as you're not having any low blood sugars. However, if you are on insulin, you want to make sure that you're not going low in the middle of the night and then rebounding as well. So if you're having high blood sugars in the morning, and really just in general, it's good to check every now and again, get up in the middle of the night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when you're going pee anyways, because you're pregnant, you probably have to pee, test your blood sugar, and just make sure that you're not having a low blood sugar, and then rebounding up when your liver dumps out that extra sugar to compensate for the low blood sugar. So if your blood sugars are still high and you're not having um, low blood sugars, talk to your healthcare provider, your doctor, your diabetes team, and make sure that you have a schedule to titrate up safely. So the other things that you can do if you're still having high blood sugars and it's not making sense, make sure that your insulin is active and something didn't happen to it. So for example, if your insulin has changed temperature drastically, that may make it inactive. So make sure that your insulin is good. Also check your injection technique. Bring your syringe or your pen into your diabetes center or your doctor, doctor and show them what you're doing and make sure that you are actually getting the correct dose and that you are using it properly. So if you have any other questions, you go down to the comment and leave your question. And if you have strategies that have helped your morning blood sugars come down, please share with our community. I'm sure that the other moms would love to hear your tips and tricks. Also head down to the description box and you can grab the gestational diabetes meal plan and snack list 
for better blood sugars and a healthy baby that is a healthy size. And if you have more questions and you want to connect with me and you want to connect with other moms with gestational diabetes, you can join our Facebook group and I will also put the link down below to that. If you like this video and you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up, a like. Make sure that you subscribe to our channel and hit the bell notification to get notified every Wednesday when we release a new video. And if you know other moms with gestational diabetes or you have a gestational diabetes group, share this information with them. It really helps me out and supports the channel. And I have enjoyed so much being here with you today and I will see you in the next video.